Welcome to Iron and Ceramite, Librarius Omnis, where we explore the depths of the Black Library. Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Librarius Omnis. Um, as per usual, um, I'm joined by John. Hello. And myself, Shane. Um, and we're going to be covering book six in the Horus Heresy today. Um, it's probably the first one that has um, maybe uneven reception, I would say, an uneven reception and, and, and definitely has its critics. Um, and that is um, Descent of Angels. Um, so I think uh, to begin with, we'll, we'll be starting off with parts one and two. Um, and going through that to begin with, uh, and then depending on how we get on, this may be another two-parter. As you know, um, if you've watched any of these or followed any of these so far in the series, myself and John do like to go in-depth and, and into detail to make sure we cover everything. So it may well be end up being a two-parter. Definitely not the, uh, the marathon that was Fulgrim, but um, <laughs> you know it's very important that we cover these details. Um, and... Before we get into the book itself, um, I, had something I, I just thought I'd cover first of all, as I touched on before, this one's got, you know, it's, it's up and down views and it's dissenting voices. Um, and just to cover, like, the actual book itself, how did, how did you find it, John? What did, what did you think of it overall? So I've read it twice now, and the, for, for story, I think it's great. Um, and so... I know I've repeated myself now and still I'm at the point where I've only read up to and included Mechanicum. So that's my heresy sort of knowledge. But like you've said before, um, that this will pay off obviously for the later um, Dark Angels book. So that's fine. The story I actually quite enjoy. Mm. Um, and the second time round, I appreciated it more. But it's the writing I have troubles with similar to my issues that we've talked about on the podcast with the space wolf the first space wolf omnibus i feel like there's a lot of this is we keep getting told points that mm. like about characters especially the main two characters i feel like we get beaten over the head with their relationship um and sometimes maybe i know that obviously these guys are essentially knights from for a really sort of basic level uh, of technology forest. Yeah. But sort of there, the constant sort of ramblings of uh, the, the thoughts going through their heads, sort of, it, it sort of really annoyed me at some point. I, ju I just find sometimes it's, it's slow yeah. because things are over explained. The story itself, I really enjoyed sort of the overall arc and yeah. how we go from start to finish. And the int I found it really interesting, um, sort of, you see their home world and, and how things were and, and it's sort of see what, how they're so rooted in tradition, which we'll get into. Yeah. Sort of, um, massively affects the end of this book, yeah. um, which I really liked, but like I say, it's the, the way that it was written. Um, I don't, I don't think for a long time, I don't think I'll read this for a third time. Um, but like I say, story was great. Uh, how about you, mate? I, 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 quite, I agree. I think, um, I think it's probably about a hundred pages too long. Um, so that's, 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 so I agree with that kind of exposition explanation. I think rightly or wrongly, the book spends too long in certain parts mm. um, just kind of really going over it. And you don't need to like, as I said, the, the beats, the story are there. Um, and there, there is, there is, as I said, the skeleton of a good, a good tale um, yeah. within, within the pages. As I said, it's just, it, it's intersped with with a lot of stuff that you don't need and it's, it's almost like it could have been it, you know it could have even been a short story i suppose i think the other thing that i i find with it so i think it's a it's a little bit long could could cut about 100 pages worth of content i think the other thing with it is it's um it's a real change of pace compared to the rest of the heresy up to this point yeah. so it's the first one if you read them back to back and you get to this one it's a real change of pace and it really kind of takes you out the flow that's established in the first five books. Yeah. And I almost think it would it would almost do itself a favour if it was not part of the main heresy series. I think if, if you just had this as like a you know um, descent of angels and fallen angels as 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 just 
two Dark Angels books, I think they would probably have re- had a better reception. I yeah. think the, you know, Fallen Angels, I think, that needs to be in, in the heresy. But I, I think it's almost like if you treat it as a standalone story, it almost then becomes better because it doesn't have the five heresy books as, as contrast. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's a little bit long. It's, it's definitely tough the first time round. I agree that on second go over, I, I preferred it. Yeah. Although, I, I, well, I preferred the story and I preferred how it moved along. But it highlighted, it probably then also exacerbated and highlighted the bits that didn't need to be there. Yeah. Um, I, <clears throat> I, think, I think the first time, because I, I was sort of pa- powering through them uh, up until we started doing this, I sort of forgive a lot of it because I was like, no, just give, give, give me if it, it whenever, whenever you got this uh, Warhammer, just give it to me. I, I'll enjoy it. Yeah. We're going back, like, because we're going back. Technically, we, well, we're going back with a critical eye. Um, so yeah, I, I think the only issue that we've picked out in any book so far was on Flight of the Eisenstein, where I think it's Valen the Apoth- Apothecary. He mm-hmm. he walks into the room holding the bloody. Uh, lodge coin and I yeah. was like yeah. uh, and that was like how stupid are you that's the only sort of thing I've picked up in these books where I've gone that was a bit silly uh, but in this one I think there's a couple of times where I sort of read it and rolled my eyes and was like oh for god's sake but um, um, but I think for the sake of being a completionist you need to read it uh, um, yes. yeah I was going to say it's definitely one for the law masters um, yeah. I think those that want to do it all and see it you, you still have to you have to read it because yes. regardless of um, you know all of those those bits and pieces we just talked about and the drawbacks and stuff like that, it does have a lot of um, like a lot of exposition and a lot of um, foreshadowing for yeah. what comes not only later on in the heresy but also in the law of the Dark Angels chapter themselves and like you know they are you know they're the first, we, well we find out in this book okay, but they are like yeah. the first legion so. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot to them, and there's a lot that's revealed here about key characters in that legion that are important to know because they play, you know, maybe not huge roles, but interesting roles as the heresy um, progresses, but also beyond that. So you know, even even to, I say to this day, to the the day that we're at in the modern forty k verse, you know. People like Cipher are still knocking around. Oh, when I say Cipher, though, obviously we know that's that's a it's like a title. But we'll get into yeah. that. But those characters are still there, um, and so there's a that for those that are into their lore and know what's coming and stuff like that. It's worth reading it because some of those little seeds are sown that will just make you want to go. Ah, right, that's where that yeah. started. That's where this happens. That's you know you start pulling at those threads and you go, okay, that's that's. That's quite cool. That's quite yeah. good to know. I think that uh, definitely um, saves this book. But like we brought up already, uh, this one's written by um, Mitchell Scanlon, and we were talking about it on the podcast, and he's only actually written two other Warhammer books. Um, it doesn't come back for the heresy at all, so might be a reason for it. We don't know. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, it's interesting, because I didn't feel that, like that, so uh, I suppose for everyone else for benefit, those that haven't watched the uh, uh, the pod yet, is that the other book we're referring to is uh, Fifteen Hours, yeah, which is interesting because that you could, I mean, you, you know, it's, it's one of the Black Library Library novels, but it is a short story effectively, right? Yeah. It's uh, I, don't, I can't remember how many pages it is, but it's, it's not like, it's not massive, no, and it feels like. If this book had been that long, <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe it would have uh, maybe it would have been better as well. Like yeah. I don't know. Like that's uh, that's yeah. So yeah. We'll, as I said, it, he he's definitely got a style. Yeah, and I think it gets. I don't know. I'm, I, I mean, I'm not going to say it because I'm not a professional writer. I'm not going to say it gets weaker as it gets longer. I've got no idea if that's the no. case. But what I would say is that you know if. I wouldn't judge him just, you know, for those of the people that don't like this book, don't judge Mitchell Scanlon on that because 15 Hours is, is a really good book. Yeah, it was really good. And obviously we don't know what else he's... I've never read anything else by him, but just based on the two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah as I said, it, it's... And, and we know from, um, 
you know, past experiences that sometimes, although people write these books for, for the Black Library and Games Workshop, that they're, they're, they've got a very kind of descriptive or a very, um, you know, um, guided way of having they're to told, do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're told what to put in and, and how to do it. And I think this is, in the heresy, this is our first look at how um, people become um space marines essentially it is yeah um, that's so true, there's right? probably a bit of that of obviously it needs to get how this works um but i think we're going to get into all that and we, if we haven't put you off already stick with us because it is all right it is good um and we'll we'll get <laughs> yeah. into it i think <laughs> don't don't read it just watch this yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay uh, uh, so cool. with that <laughs> part one um yeah so well, yeah, do, you, do, you to, to, do you want to kick sorry. us off? Yeah, so before we get to part one, um, we have a, a prelude. I think we're the, this is the first book that has a prelude. Um, and this gives us an uh, introduction to, at this time, an unnamed character uh, whose identity we don't find out um, at all for a, or at this part, who gives us a brief rundown on Caliban. Um, so we learn a few, a few key sort of elements that we'll... Uh, we need to know now, which will help us out throughout the book and, and sort of show a few people's motivations. Um, so Caliban is um, a forest planet completely covered by trees with some settlements throughout. Um, it's been separated from the rest of mankind and Terra for about 5,000 years. Uh, and obviously through separation, they have li um, derived their own traditions, way of life. And to them, Terra is little more than a myth. Mm -hmm. Um, these settlements um, all over the planet have different knightly orders uh, and factions um, and the knights of Caliban serve um, to fight and destroy the great beasts which are essentially like uh, mythical beings um, they're all they're all different not one sort of species they all look different one will be oh the famous one is the uh, Calibanite lion um, which is what it is it's a giant a mutated lion and other things of like serpent heads or look at in a myth mythology look into a i can't say it tongue tongue tie. Yeah, yeah, mythological uh, in, monsters yeah, and yeah. beasts like you know manticores hydras all inspired by that sort yeah. of stuff um yeah. chaos spawn perhaps probably yeah um but you know that's a yeah well we won't go into that spoiler <laughs> um so they don't have any vehicles because this is a very medieval themed planet um they have horses um, uh, the only thing they do have are crude versions of the bolt pistols and chainsaws from a time long ago. Yeah, it's, um, it's quite interesting when they describe some of their the stuff they have. So obviously, Terra has almost taken on a mythical, um, a mythical kind of viewpoint in that there there are points where it's discussed as to whether or not it even exists anymore, yeah. whether the people are even there anymore. And as you said, you do see. Like they talk about it in various stages of the book as well, like how the the power armor they use. Um, you know, uh, some point in their dark history, used to be able to be sealed, closed, and was mechanized and and stuff like that. So very much power armor, yeah. but they've forgotten the wisdom or, or the the knowledge to keep it maintained. So that's yeah. why, as it, as you said, it's it's a feudal world. Um, I believe it's. I think Caliban was classed as a death world as well. Um, but I'm not sure about that. Definitely feudal. Um, and obviously, um, yeah, as I said, the, the technology that had landed with the original settlers, the knowledge to keep it going had been forgotten. And so it's, it's maintained and, and thus kind of, as you said, in that medieval feudal state with knightly orders. And you can only join a knightly order if you're, uh, if you're of high birth yeah. until, until the order the, comes along. Yeah. Um, and they will recruit anybody, um, which upsets quite a, a lot of the other factions because they want to um, expand, obviously, maybe to be the biggest, but also the fight against the beasts is quite serious. Mm -hmm. um, and early on in their history, the narrator tells us one faction called the Knights of the Crimson Chalice declared war on the Order, but they were quickly defeated. Uh, and as a result, the Order then grew to become the most powerful faction on uh, Caliban. And then, just to um, put the topping on the cake, they then discovered a man li living in the wilderness. Um, was it uh, Luther 
discovered a complete wild man rolling yeah, around, uh, kicking about in, in the woods, uh, took him back to the fortress and going from almost a Tarzan like person within a few days, he mastered speech. Uh, within weeks, he was the most educated and wisest person uh, in the, within the order. And then after that, he then become the, the, the strongest and best warrior, uh, which obviously um, piqued all the locals' interests and people would travel just to join the order or for the chance to join the order. Um, and they named him Lion L. Johnson, as this means Lion of the Forest in the mm -hmm. old tongue of Caliban. Uh, and obviously, if you haven't guessed it yet, Lionel Johnson, he will go on to become one of the Primarchs. He will, um, yeah. But at this time, nobody knows that he's just um, an anomaly to them at the minute. Uh, so the Lion proposed that uh, mankind will work together on a huge quest to eliminate the great, the great beasts. Um, and at the time, many were against it. Um, but he, he sort of pushed on with his plans and said that it would take them six years to, to get every last beast. Uh, and many were resistant. They were afraid uh, that they wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, and some more superstitious were afraid that it would bring on the end of times. Um, and uh, others were just worried that they were using, he was using them as tools, saying that the, the humans would do the work while he would just... Uh, sit there and and sort of preside over them yeah um but eventually he wins the argument and it turns out that his quest didn't take six years it took 10 years um and then we then our attention goes from uh, the lion and the narrator talks to us about luther uh, the man who found the lion and taught him everything that he knew um the closest thing to an equal and brother they fought together uh, and were as close as brothers. However, um, people would overlook Luther whenever he was in the presence of the lion. Um, after years of campaigning, the seeds of resentment set into Luther's heart. But the narrator also tells us that he doesn't believe that it happened this early on. Yeah. Um, and we sort of get the impression that whoever the narrator is isn't necessarily a fan of the lion. <coughs> Uh, and he's quite defensive. Hang on, someone's at the door, mate. That's all right, mate. No worries. Uh, so uh, the narrator, he tells us um, that the years of campaigning put seeds of resentment into the lion, into Luther's heart. Many believe that it started this early on, but the narrator believes that this comes much later. Uh, and from the way the narrator actually speaks, you feel like he's not necessarily a fan of the lion. Uh, he's very supportive of Luther. Uh, he then ends by telling us we are in the 10th and final year of the campaign against the Great Beasts, and we are on the cusp of the arrival of the Dark Angels. And that takes us into part one, Caliban. Mm -hmm. um, so, as we were told in the prelude, we're going way back before the heresy. Um, the Astartes aren't even known uh, to those on Caliban, mm -hmm. uh, we don't know what a Primarch is, or we don't know what an Astartes is. Um, the Lion is now part of the Order. He's um, not necessarily the leader, but he is um, quite a heavy influence on the uh, the comings and goings and the daily sort of life of those within the Order. Uh, and then we introduce to our main character. Um, he is a aspirant of the order and his yep. name is Zahariel um, and he's woken in his bed when Lord Cypher's men come for him um, and then from there he's uh, essentially dragged from his bed they put a bag over him so he can't see and he's taken out and shoved into a, into a dark room yep. um, and obviously if you don't know it feels like he's about to be punished or interrogated but he already knows um, and he's been pre-warned. This is the final test in the process to join the order. Um, and he must pass it. Um, and he knows that he's been told that a number of high ranking members of the order will quiz him and test his mental strength. Uh, and if he fails, he could be killed on the spot. Um, and he's not like, I'm going to say that, that as well, it's like he's a boy at this point. He's, he's, yeah, he's, he's not old. Like he's, uh, you know, he's, he is a young like, you know, like primary school type kid at this point. Yeah. And this is one of the things that I was going to bring up as we go through, because I think from here, he's like, 
eight or nine years old. Yeah. And then by the time things happen, he's only like 15 or 16. Yeah, when he, when he, because he's like 15 or 16, and it comes up when we get there, but he's one of the eldest to be going through the yeah. trial. I think. And, and okay, uh, you, you got to suspend your disbelief for, uh, to enjoy it, I suppose, these books. But some of this stuff that he's going to do over the next couple of years, I just think, come on, there's no way. I don't care what planet you're from, unless um, their days are longer there or something. I was going to say, maybe maybe a Caliban <laughs> year is uh, it's like dog years or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I know. Like, he's 30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he's, he's going to do some impressive stuff that, uh, like, you'd be, you'd be impressed seeing a grown man do some of this stuff in a bit. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so for I think he's like eight or nine. He, he's pretty tough. Yeah. Um, so um, one of the voices in this room asks why he's there. And he says he's completed his training and he has been deemed worthy. Uh, remembering back to some training with his uh, master, Ramiel, mm -hmm. um, from the day before, preparing him, um, telling him what was to come. And his initiation into the order, he must be ready. Um, and our first bit of tradition that we go to here is uh, within the hall, they're talking about uh, walking the, uh, the spiral, which is uh, worn, it's like a, a path on the floor that they sort of um, practice a routine. It's like a walkthrough routine. Um, and it's something that they will have to do um, to train the warriors in the art of footwork and swordsmanship. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also to help them learn an unbreakable self-defense by repetition and practice. Um, Ramiel tells him the uh, initiation actually predates even their arrival in Caliban uh, and might be a tradition from terror but no one can remember uh, and they don't do it for a religious reason or a supernatural reason but it's uh, for tradition to create a bond and unity um, Ramiel tells him that the spiral is sort of taken from the oldest tombs of men but um, like I said, it, it's more rather than religious. It's more spiritual, and yeah. it helps them to find their rebirth of man during life and death. So it's sort of a, a, a prelude to of what's sort of coming um, throughout the book. Yeah. Uh, hit us over the head with that, um, <laughs> and now he sort of um, flashes back to where where he is now. He's being initiated, um, like an interrogation. He's on his knees, and someone puts a knife to his throat. And he's been asked questions about um, the verbatim, which is sort of their, um, not holy book, but their uh, rule book, I guess. Yep. Yep. Um, and he's reciting these passages word for word. And then they start sort of drilling him about weird things like fighting styles, the best way to hold a sword against a certain opponent and really finicky details. Um, yeah. Parry, riposte. You know, your opponent strikes you down from the left. Where do you where do you hit back? All that sort of jazz. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they and they really like want word for word how, how he would do it. Yeah. Um, and then even stuff about surviving in the wild to how to look after a tame a war horse. Um, then there are uh, a number of voices uh, asking these questions. The only one he recognises is that of Lord Cipher, um, and the other two are questioning him one seems very harsh uh, and is almost from the offset saying they should just be done with him he's no good let's just kill him um we don't want him in the order um but um he manages to sort of win through uh, mm -hmm. and, one, and one of the voices says no, you've taken that too far um we're not going to kill him uh, and then the voice relents and says yes i've played my part I had no doubt of him in the first place, and they and they take the bag from his head, yep. um, and then we get the reveal of the three voices. The first one was Lord Cipher, um, the second one is Sar Lufa, um, who's smiling at him uh, and giving him sort of a thumbs up, and then the third and final voice was the Lion himself, which Zahari is absolutely stunned by. Yep. Um, and sort of from there, they they sort of. Let him relax and uh, and and, and um, let him know. Yep, yeah, don't worry. You, you've passed these tests. You're, you're through. Relax. Um, it's just part part of it. Um, and then they they sort of um, say you've made it through. You, you're initiated. And they get him to swear an oath of loyalty by cutting the palm of his hand. Yep. Um, 
and he has to swear that he'll never raise arms against a brother uh, unless it's part of a duel or a sanctioned matter of honour or um, pain of death. Yep. Uh, he swears his oath and sheds his lineage. Um, so he's no longer Zaharial, um, the peasant. He's now Zaharial of the Order. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, and that's sort of his intro. Then we get introduced to um, his cousin um, and counterpart, Nemil. Yep. Um, and th- th- they join together. They're, they're often mistaken as brothers, um, but I think they're, they're cousins. Yeah. Um, yep. And then this is one of the things we spoke about. We we're going to get beaten over the head with the point that they're extremely competitive with one another. Um <laughs> And actually, but actually, for now, it's quite a benefit because the only reason they've each made it this far is because of their competitiveness and not wanting to give up and look weak in front of the other one. Yeah. Uh, and they, and they they pushed it through. And even though they're always happy to be together, they always think, "Oh, I hope I do better than the other one." Yeah, that's it. They're very, very, very competitive. And as yeah. you said, it's definitely you're left in no doubt about that. Um, as the book goes on because it frequently takes the opportunity to tell you about their competitiveness every time one of them stands up yeah. basically the other one's saying oh i can do that better <laughs> and, and, and it goes into everything they do um so i think the first sort of example we get is um like that they were they were having a, a, a training fight and that went on for nearly 15 minutes before remiel master remiel uh, said they call it a draw um, and that's one of them that, wins yeah um and uh, Zaharil goes in for a faint attack, uh, which Nemil falls for, and Zaharil punches him in the face and knocks him down, getting the win, um, which greatly wounds uh, Nemil's honour. Um, they, but, I can't remember which one's older. Is it Nemil? Like, he's only older by, like, two weeks or something like that. Yeah. Um, it might be Zaharil. I can't remember which way around it is, but they make a big deal out of it. And I'm like, when you're eight or nine, two weeks age difference does not suddenly no. make you knackered like <laughs> no no and, and that's it they're, they're like basically twins if yeah. it for the sake of a, few, a couple of weeks um yeah i think it, i think it's nemo that's the older one i think so. it might be the other way around that, that's an inconsequential like for some reason they throw that out there it don't matter to us but i remember to them it really does for, yeah it means a lot to them <laughs> um so after this little fight uh, they shake hands have a chat about how lucky they are to be uh, alive during the era of Luther and the lion. Um, and uh, Nemil is less convinced because he says, well, yeah, we've got that, but we're also alive in the time where we have to fight these giant beasts that want to eat us all the time. Uh, he's, he's a bit more of a downer uh, or uh, pessimistic. Um, and then they have like another sort of talk about, do they think that terror is a myth? Uh, and Nemil says, well, if it is real, it must be a paradise, um, like a heaven or something. Yeah. Um, and then they are interrupted and told they need to get to the lecture hall um, because one of the knights, brother Amadis, has returned and he's going to go and give them a lecture. Uh, and obviously everyone's really excited by this because Amadis is one of the greatest heroes of the order. And he is rumoured to have slain many beasts. Um, yeah. And everyone wants to obviously... Uh, to aspire, aspire to be him. Um, and they thought, until, until they actually discovered the lion, they thought that he may actually be in line to become um, the Grand Master of the Order. But um, obviously the lion's going to take priority there. So yep. uh, Amadis has been out crusading on his own, killing yeah. beasts left, right and centre. Takes it with good grace. Like He just gets, gets on with what he's going to do, as is his knightly way. Yeah, um, and I think they talk about it as well that um, Luther could have also been um, potential to have been the grand, grand master as well. Um, yeah. I think that comes later in the book as well. But basically, there is this uh, an under underlying narrative that's kind of pinned forward that that you know even though they're all everyone's chummy and loving it and it's amazing that like there's they start sowing the seeds of of how someone could potentially resent someone like the lion um because it's just you know through no fault of his own other than timing um luther's gone from being like the 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 biggest person in town and then the best and you know right at the top of the tree and you know greatest warrior and greatest speaker and all of this sort of stuff um 
only to have it all overshadowed by uh, by the uh, the jungle boy he found in the forest. Yeah, <laughs> got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, they 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 go to this um, speech with Brother Amadis. Uh, it's not really much of a speech, but he basically just tells them about honor. Uh, he says, that, yeah, you might hear grand tales, but you could tell grand tale about everyone. Just look at their actual into their actions. Don't get a big head, uh, and just be true and uh, and uh, serve with pride. And uh, Zahara was very inspired and makes an oath to himself to be the best knight that he can be. Mm. Um, so we go into chapter three and we get a bit of a look at um, how Zahari or Neville got to this point. Uh, Zahari was having a bit of a nightmare um, and it's a memory of his recruitment into the order. Yeah. And he was seven years, so we go back. So at the minute he's nine. Uh, he was seven years old when he first came uh, to this fortress uh, and it's the middle of winter. And it's the only time that the order actually take on new recruits. Hundreds of children were brought to the fortress, hoping to make it through the trials um, and, and become inducted. Um, so one of the, I think it's the first test they have to do is the children all taken outside um, in the middle of the night. Um, or no, they, they're taken outside um, during the day and they have to sort of stand there, nothing but their um clothes they have their their coats and boots taken from them and they're out in the snow not allowed to rest or sit down or eat and they just sort of have to stand there in in ranks uh, and then obviously um it's snowing horribly for them um and then you've got the guards or the or the knights i suppose are walking up and down taunting these seven-year-olds yeah. saying that <laughs> you're it never gonna make very, it very <laughs> very sketchy <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh they're going to throw him in the woods and, uh, and all this sort of stuff if, if they can't handle it. Uh, and yeah, so th I think they stood uh, outside the walls and the forest is just in front of them. <laughs> and you've got these grown men walking up and down, <laughs> threatening them. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> but he's having a nightmare. So we don't know quite how accurate this is. Um, and um, they come in his nightmare. He remembers uh, one of the knights coming up to us, one boy in particular, telling him how well he's done, uh, that he doesn't actually need to do this test, and they'll take him inside. He can just, he can just um, he's give made up it. because yeah, he, he's gonna, he's gonna do it. Uh, and this kid falls down to his knees. He's so happy, uh, and he goes, "Yeah, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll come in with you." And, but instead, they pick him up and, and they lob him into the woods. Um, um, it's not, <laughs> it's not a good move. No. You know. <laughs> um, if he, if he weren't seven, he might have saw it for the trick it was. Um, but he gets thrown into the woods and then all the kids' um, fear rises because they can hear these beasts calling about out there. Um, and Zahari all hears a voice telling him, um, if you come, if you walk into the forest, everything can be yours. Anything you desire will be yours. Just come into the woods. Um, and obviously he has an internal battle, but uh, manages um, to look and see his cousin never all standing still and standing pr proudly takes inspiration from him and decides no I'm, I'm gonna stay um, and then it gets dark the, the knights go in and leave the boys to it outside um, and then in the morning only 12 boys remained yeah. um, and at this point Master Ramiel comes out um, and sort of um, Ask them, why do you think you've made it when no one else could? Uh, and he tells them it's because you, um, your minds were stronger than the others. And that is more important than anything else is to have a strong mind. Uh, and that is why you are going to be brought in and um, allowed to try to join the order for real. Yeah. Uh, so he wakes up. Uh, he's woken up from that uh, lovely nightmare um, by Nemil, who tells them that they're going on a hunt. Um and this is sort of our, our first look outside the walls. Um, and we jump to Zahara riding a horse. He's been given command of his squad, um, has Nemo with him and a group of eight other boys. Um, and there are another five groups out, um, similar size, um, all, all out on their own doing hunts. And you've got Brother Amadis is out riding between them, making sure everyone's okay and sort yep. of gu guiding them throughout. Um, and they're all uh, out on war horses um, and they've all been given very, very basic armor. Um, 
very old, unrepaired sort of stuff. And Zaharil, in his helmet, he's got comms, so he can talk to the other squad leaders yeah. uh, and, and brother Amidus. Um, and we get introduced to a couple of other boys in Zaharil's group. Um, we have um, Atius, who is um, a bit younger than the others, um, who Zahari was taken under his wing and he's been helping him through. He's very book smart, but he's not necessarily the toughest, um, but he's helped him through. And then you have uh, Eliaf, um, who's uh, a big, brutally um, lumpy kid. They all take the mick out of him for being a fatty, but actually <laughs> he's just um, got more muscle than the others. Um, yeah. And he's a stocky boy. So they're, and they're like the main two friends that uh, they make um, for now. Uh, so they travel a few kilometres, uh, quite a way out. Um, and Zahari was starting to get a bit bored and wonders when they're going to find something. When, luckily for him, a winged beast swoops in um, and literally just cuts that in half. Uh, one of his squad um, clean through the boy, clean through the horse yep. uh, and everyone um, shits their pants. Uh, and but that's uh, a fair summation, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, he gets his pistol out, and before he has a chance to do anything, this beast swoops back in and, and just kills another boy outright. Yeah. Um, and uh, this this beast is like, like we said, um, another um, beast from nightmares. Uh, it's got serpent. Uh, it's like a serpent-like body with large livery wings and claws, and a big long neck full of razor sharp teeth. Um, and he sort of freezes. Um, with fear and this beast uh, swipes him, sending him flying from his horse um, and um, starts coming towards him ready to kill um, Zaharo, he manages to get off a few shots with his pistol and crawl away uh, and the beast is distracted by Nemeral and, and, and some of the others um, firing their pistols yep. um, the beast sort of swings out its, its tail um, hitting Nemeral, sending him flying through smashing him into a tree uh, and then it turns on uh, Atius. Um, but Zaharil steps up, uh, having already seen two of his uh, brothers killed, uh, and, and calls out, um, taking the, the beast's attention, which uh, the beast turns around and charges him, um, and he shoots it again, causing it to bleed, but not really doing any damage. Uh, and then it hits him, sending him flying. Um, and uh, as he's like getting back onto his feet, um, he can see like the others regrouping, Atius riding off into the trees um, on his horse and the beast going for him. Yep. Um, and uh, Zaharil gets up and starts running towards the beast, sees it, knocks Atius from his horse. Um, luckily, Atius survives, but it, it, it sort of rips the horse in half. Uh, and another boy runs out to help Atius up, but the, this beast um, grabs this kid <laughs> by the arm, throws him into the air and rips his arms off. <laughs> and as he lands on the floor, it just guts him and, uh, and eats him in front of everybody else. <laughs> just a, a horde of uh, a class of primary school kids have been brutalised <laughs> by uh, by chaos, chaos spawn or whatever it is. And it's yeah. like, it's effectively like a class outing, but, but all the kids have got swords and the teachers are knights. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if um, yours did it, but ours did. Um, the dragon come to school, where the teacher did like a three D thing on the phone. It was like an effect on the phone in the playground oh, that this that. dragon landed. So it's like <laughs> if the teachers have brought a real dragon in and said, "You're on your own." Yeah. There, there you go. Get, yeah. there's, there's a gun. Go and kill it. <laughs> <laughs> really responsible. Um, and these, yeah, and these are good guys as well, aren't they? As yeah, we've established. I was, I was say, yeah. It's all, it's all good guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah uh, this this poor kid um, he, he gets his guts ripped out um, and um, Zahari was really battered and bruised now um, but he's determined not to lose anybody else um, and he charges at the beast uh, and actually manages with his sword to cut off one of its claws uh, and as the beast turns to sort of finish him Brother Amadis uh, arrives charging the beast and, and manages to um, kill it by blowing its brains out with his pistol yeah. um and uh Zaharil passes out um just as uh, amadis comes to his rescue and tells him he's done a good job um so uh later um i think back at the fortress um 
when he's recovered. Zahari or Nemil, who both survived, are talking. And um, Nemil sort of uh, really supportively tells him well, that you were lucky and you should uh, rely on that in the future because your luck will run out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, which is, and then here the book says, um, this is something that Nemo will repeat to him for years and years because he'll just keep bringing up this fact that he was lucky not to die. Um, so a bit like their competitiveness. Now he's going to, he's got one up on him goes, well, you're lucky that brother Maddis was there. Otherwise you'd yeah. be dead mate. Um, which is a bit of a weird thing for him to sort of hold a grudge against. Um, yeah. Like it's just, it's, it's, it's a weird, it's like, it's, yeah, it's a weird relationship these two have because as I said, that. They, they almost need each other to get to where they're going to be within the order. Yeah. Especially Nemiel's side. I don't know if it's just how it's written, but he definitely comes across like begrudging a lot of things and jealous about it. So he's like, you know, it's, it, it, as it goes on, it makes what was, you know, like a friendly rivalry slightly less friendly as it develops. Yeah. Although it does come back around a bit, but it's, yeah, he's, he's like, you know, you just, it's luck rather than skill or anything or bravery that's uh, that's kept him alive. And yeah, if he's very moody Mardis, about it. Yeah, if, if yeah. brother, you know, Mardis hadn't been there, uh, that would have caused him problems and like you know, various bits and pieces. He, he, he like he can't just be happy for him. He has to be like give him a dig yeah. rather than just be like well done. And it what doesn't help is that Mardis is. Uh, He's he's not only praising Zahari to his to his face and saying well done, but he's also giving all of this good feedback to um, what's his name the uh, the tutor. Uh, 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 Nemil Remil. Remil. They've got yeah. similar Ram- names, haven't they? So you got Ram- uh, Ram- 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 yeah, you know, you know <laughs> yeah, you got cousin Nemil and uh, Master Remil. Yeah, so yeah. he's given he's given him like good feedback, but also to the likes of Luther and and the Lion as well. So. Yeah. All of this is feeding that kind of uh, jealousy um, that that fuels what was a friendly rivalry between Nemiel and uh, Zahariel. But uh, you know, yeah. at the same time, that you know, they, they're still close because they still need each other to get through, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, pretty much. Um, and like Zahariel just sort of doesn't understand why he keeps bringing it back up, but he'll never he'll never question him because he's just trying to be a nice guy, mm-hmm. um, and. It doesn't help because obviously all their friends keep getting him to recount this story to him, uh, which he doesn't want to do. But obviously, um, the more he tells it, the more of a story it becomes. Yeah. Um, and he sort of decides here, look, the only way to conquer fear is to face it. And that's what he tells everybody. Um, and that sort of ends part one uh, and brings us into part two, Beast, which I yeah. think we'll roll straight into. We are, yeah, um, let's do it. Let's keep going. Yeah. Um, so it's been a couple of years since uh, the attack in the forest. Um, and so for those keeping score, the kids are now 12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, so what I'll put here, so years have passed. Um, Zahara has become more acclaimed within the order um, for his bravery that day. So like I said just a minute ago, that story has been told and told and told countless mm-hmm. times of how this nine-year-old stood up to the beast that was killing his schoolmates. Um, and yeah. it yeah. mentions like Nemiel is still bitter and he's not held in as high regard. And then I wrote here, these two are very petty and it's getting annoying. Because <laughs> um, I think we've actually cut, even though I feel like we've gone on about it, we have cut out quite a lot of these little viral rivalries i think it's it's, you know i think we should try because as i said there's there's a lot of stuff like you know there are a lot of moments where they talk about it and like they talk about you know how they've had these moments and various training bits there's going to be more throughout the book and i think it's one of the things we picked up at the beginning yeah is that this this i don't think it's fine to cut them out because as i said this book could be 100 pages shorter yeah and all we're really not covering is those bits where it's it's overdone so yeah. we have we're not we're not skipping over stuff we are just kind of missing you know one mentions enough you don't need to, you don't need to hear every way that nemi all picks at uh, his cousin <laughs> and, and vice versa it's the same stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah um although that, yeah so um 
but going from there, so we go straight into another sparring lesson between them. Uh, and Master Ramiel tells them they're on the path to becoming great protectors of Caliban. Um, and whilst walking away, um, Zahario and Neriel sort of moan about hearing him uh, repeating this over and over again. He's always repeating himself, telling them the same stuff they know. Um, and uh, they say as long as they can master the fighting skills, they'll, they'll put up with the lectures and then they won't have as much problem when it comes to killing the next beast. Uh, and then Nemil asks uh, Zahario if he thinks that that beast they fought um, was sentient and had the power of thought. And they have a bit of a discussion. Um, and Zahario thinks it's just like a killing machine. It has no, no sort of uh, thoughts of its own. It's just there to kill uh, because to him, a sentient beast would need to be able to plan a future and not just um, be looking for its next meal. Yeah. Um, but sort of they he sort of finishes by saying like no human mind can hope to know what goes on in a non-human mind, um, which is actually like, as we've seen through the previous books that when, once you're in the like you can't even think that these alien, these Xenos um, are sentient. They just, they just kill them. doesn't matter. doesn't matter if they're talking to you. They're just aliens. Just get yeah, rid of them. That's, that's yeah. They're, they're, they're those towel, they're, they're not thinking. The, the yeah. old Eldari, they might be talking to me. They're not sentient. Yeah. It's a uh, uh, <laughs> very, very binary approach. Yeah. And he's already got the Astartes mindset of just kill it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so later on, uh, they're having their firing drills and Zahariel's weapon, he's having issues with it. Um, he actually uh, a, a crack shot, but his weapon's pulling to the left. Um, and he tells the armorer he thinks that his weapon is like past its age now. And that's what the issues are. But he's told, nope, you're just not taking care of it. He doesn't like um, that at all. <laughs> no. So he marches off back to his dorm uh, and he's sort of scrubbing his weapon. And it's like, every, he knows, everybody knows his weapon is the cleanest weapon to ever yeah. be cleaned. Um, and then, won't mention it, but Nemo does make a jive about it. Um, and then um, Zahari says, oh, you think you're better than me? And then uh, Remy all storms off in a huff because they have a little argument. Uh, and then uh, brother Amadis comes and says, look, you need to come with me. Uh, Lord Cypher wants to see you. Um, so Zahari goes with him and he takes him deep within the monastery and they come out uh, into a large chamber. Um, and there are hundreds of candles on the floor marking out the spiral that we spoke about earlier in part one. Yeah. Um, and Lord Cypher is standing in the centre and he tells Zahariel to start walking the spiral uh, and starts quizzing him. Uh, and we learn a little bit about Lord Cypher um, here. Um, I don't know if you want to go into that one. So, yeah, in, in this regard, as I said, learning about Lord Cypher, we learn... So one of the things that he's, he's quizzing him on is quite interesting and in, in a lot of the theme of this book is, is to do with tradition and like the fight between uh the importance of tradition and what like it, it's one of the, the underlying themes like the importance of tradition versus progress and it's kind of it, it's really interesting because there are other knightly orders that don't like the order which is which is obviously the one that we we focus on the one that my, the lion is part of because they're too progressive and are leaving behind you know some some old caliban traditions and then that sort of then goes even further when you get the arrival of the Imperium because, you know, that tradition is then, it, it's like, it's really diametrically opposed. So it, it's quite interesting. But at, this is the start of that underlying narrative because yeah. we learn that, like, the Lord Cypher is there to... Um, so he pays note to the fact that, you know, even though the Order is different to the other Knightly Orders, it still has its own traditions. And it still has its own history and its way of doing things. And that tradition is a, you know, is an important part of sort of marking where you came from and where you're going. So you learn that the the Lord Cipher role is, um, it's a title that's bestowed upon uh, that Lord Cipher, and no one's allowed to know their identity. So no one like knows who you were before or who you are after. You are just the Lord Cipher, and so you learn that actually Cipher. As a, as a title is just that and that at some point um, the current Lord Cypher will, will step down and there will be a new Lord Cypher and that could be, I think at some point it's mentioned that it could be 
it Ram Ram Ramiel? Ramiel. Ramiel. Yeah. Could, Ramiel. I think he's pegged to be the replacement, isn't he? He could point? he could be a good replacement. <clears throat> there are obviously others, but once you become that 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 Lord Cipher, that's where your old identity is goes. And there's there's a lot of stuff actually that they talk about identity as well. So, you know, when you join the order, you leave behind your uh, old title, like whether mm -hmm. it's a peasant or, or a highborn. And then it talks about it further as well. We, we, if you go on a quest, you like you're caught between two worlds. And if you succeed in your, your quest or, or, or your journey against a beast or whatever, then you will come back someone else. And then again, likewise, when you become an Astarte, you're going, you're taking this other leap beyond where you were. So all of these little plot points and, and narratives are spun out from this first a deeper discussion with mm -hmm. with Lord Cipher and um what what his role is and what it means. And again, it's another one like Zahariel, you know, he's asked questions and he has to answer the right way and he's, you know, answer quickly and keep his answers concise and all of this sort of stuff. Um so again it's a bit of a test. And then if I remember correctly, as they come to the end of their discussion, isn't that with the lion? That's, yeah, he says you've got to go off and see the light. Yeah, it's like um, because Zahara obviously he's passing the, the, the test and that, and um, he sort of like you said quizzes him about himself as well and says, Well, yeah, my, my role is strictly ceremonial, but my actual power is that I have the ear of the leaders of the order, yeah, um, and uh. Zahariel thought that obviously Cypher was um, going to be the one to decide if he gets to join, uh, and and Cypher says no, that's not my decision to make. I'm here to I can advise, and I'm here to sort of whisper into people's ears. Um, and Zahariel says, well, if it's not for you to decide, then who is it? And that's when the lion's voice comes out of the darkness and says, that would be me. Um, and yeah, and then he then takes Zahariel from the deepest depths. Of the uh, fortress, right to the, the, the top of a tower, yeah. Um, and they ha have a bit of a moment um, where the lion sort of says he's heard great things about him and he's going to keep an eye on him. Um, and he tells him like the campaign's coming to an end, and he thinks there might only be about a dozen beasts remaining. Yeah. Uh, and all they have to do is take on the North Wilds. That's the last area, and he thinks that that should be done within about three months. Um, and he sort of tells him that he should be proud because his name's going to go on record as having slayed uh, one of the beasts, um, and he has the um, the makings of a master warrior, um, and he should um, be adept at killing beasts as he is at making peace with uh, others. That's it. Um, and they have a bit of a, a bit more of a talk, and he tells him there's supposedly he he feels like there's at least another thousand worlds similar to caliban terror is one of them um and he believes it's very strange that it's been so long since caliban and terror have had any con contact but everyone seems to know what terror is yeah um and sort of wonders like how much truth is behind it um and then and this is like the lion sort of says he likes the traditions that they have but it actually seems to cause people to be stuck in their ways, refuse to accept any changes for the better. Uh, and uh, he tells him about how much trouble he had getting the plan to purge the beasts to go ahead. Um, and he sort of says, here, I wish I could erase Caliban's past, start fresh, and not be tied down by traditions and just do it my way. Um, and he tells him that he's had dreams of like a golden light uh, uh, and being able to travel the stars. Um, because they don't have any sort of technology like that at the minute um, to get them even off planet. Um, and then, like I say, he tells him he has potential. He looks forward to seeing his future. Um, and then he sort of dismisses him. Uh, and Zahari was left to feel like he was definitely glad to be born in the time of Lufa and the Lion and can't yeah. wait to, to get on with things. Um, and that sort of pushes us into chapter six. Um, and previous to where the lion thought it was going to take six years to finish his quest, and it took 10, um, he said it was going to take three months, but now um, we find out it's taken at least another year. Um, the the yeah. North Wilds have been very hard to penetrate due to the thickness of the woodlands. Um, 
there's only a couple of settlements within where they can sort of take shelter um, on their quests. Um, but the main reason that they haven't been able to do this is because they're trying to broke, um, broker a deal between another order called the Knights of Lupus. Um, and the Knights of Lupus, uh, their fortress is actually within the North Wilds, yep. and they're the uh, main contenders um, left that have resisted uh, this quest. Um, yeah, they, and... they've, they've kind of been opposed to the, the great hunt or the, 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 the hunt for the, the beasts overall. They've always been like, um, uh, they, they've always been against the order. Like yeah. as, as a whole, and they stand against them against this hunt as well. A lot of this, you know, is is revealed as as goes on as well. Like why that may be, um, and I think what's what's interesting is um, it, again that with with this particular order, it comes up. We see tradition come up again in terms of of one of their reasons behind it and stuff like that. Um, but it's, I think, it's quite interesting that Johnson again. It, Although he is, you know, this this incredibly smart Primarch, he's not very good with his estimates. Um, <laughs> so you wouldn't want him doing your extension because he's, it's going to end up costing you about 25% more than what he quotes you. Um, but basically, he keeps coming up with all of these, you know, timelines and maybe miscalculates based on the fact that he's looking at himself as the benchmark. Yeah. Um, and this is a, another example of where he's done that. And he's sending... You know his knights um, in into into the North Wilds, and you know again we haven't really, although we know Caliban is this forest world. I think it, it's mentioned when he actually speaks to um, speaks to the lion previously, but not many of them really see horizons because there's always forests in the way, and mm -hmm. then, imagine that this is this is even more so. Um, and one of the, I think it comes to a head with the Knights of Lupus because um, their scouts, so the scouts of the Order have gone in to the North Wild previously and the Knights of Lupus have actually killed them and they've said, nope, you're not coming into the North Wild. So they've, they've killed the scouts. And part of this has been because, according to the Knights of Lupus, mm. that those scouts going in there has, has, has broken a treaty or an agreement that the Order and Johnson has had with uh, yeah. the Lupus and Lord uh, Sartana. So it was made, it was, because um, they were threatening war originally. I yes. think similar, was it the Knights of the Red Chalice or whatever it was from before. So these were threatening to go to war as well. But it was Luther who made a unknown deal with them. Yes. Um, so I suppose... Uh, that was probably we won't send anyone into the North Wilds. I think that was it. It was, and, and that, that was exactly it. It was kind of like, and that's why the North Wilds are like the last stronghold and the largest yeah. because they're like, and as far as the uh, the Knights of Lupus are concerned, that's that's the way it was going to be. But obviously yeah. Johnson being Johnson's like that. I mean, we've got this far. Yeah. We are going to cleanse Caliban of these great beasts because we don't want anyone living in uh, living in living in fear at this point. Yeah. And that sort of, um, like to your point, bring, brings them to, to the, the head now because uh, um, we find out that um, Lord Sartana, who is the leader of the Knights of Lupus, has been um, not summoned but invited to the Fortress of the Order mm -hmm. uh, for a final meeting, uh, which we find out will decide whether they go to war or not. Obviously, everyone's hoping that it won't result in war, uh, yeah. or so we think. Yeah. Um, and uh, Nemo and Zahara have been told to get into their best dress uniform. They're going to be present. The whole order is going to be present for the meeting in the um, lecture theatre. But they're going to be part of the sort of welcome party. Yeah. Um, and the, everybody's gathered. Um, and the two uh, cousins are stood sort of with Brother Madis in a, in a um, what's it called? Like in a, in a uh, pride of place position. Yeah, they're, um, the, they're, yeah, they're right at the front, aren't they? They're yeah. um, not, not quite the honour guard, but um, getting as close as they can be to it. Yeah. Uh, and they have sort of a bit of a chat between them, sort of talking about the Knights of Lupus are one of these stubborn but dying out breeds. Um, they're getting upset because the success of their um, order is dwindling because everybody wants to join the order. But now the lion's here yep. uh, and his quest is going so well. Everyone wants to go there. Um and then we're sort of curious of why they're inviting this smaller order in. 
for making such a show of power. Um, and he said, this is, um, Brother Amadis tells him, well, this is because Lord Sartana is definitely coming here to declare war. And hopefully by seeing our numbers, that will change his mind. Yeah. Um, and uh, so L the Lion, Lufa, Cypher, um, enter accompanying um, Lord Sartana uh, and welcome him. And then immediately uh, Lord Sartana says, well, I wanted a private meeting. What the hell is this? Uh, this is just a display of your power to try and scare me. Uh, and Luther tries to calm him down. So look, we're trying to deal openly. We don't deal in secrets and lies. We want everybody here to know the truth. Yeah. Um, and Lord Sartana basically tells him where to stick it um, and wants to know um, about, he, he wants uh, an explanation for the insult and demands uh, the explanation for the invasion. And the lion tells him that those people that he killed were just scouting the area and mapping the boundaries. Um, but obviously they disagree on that. Uh, Lord Sartana, like we said, said that he was promised that he would be left alone. And the lion basically calls him an idiot uh, and says, look, one of your, uh, your settlements is still being attacked by a beast, uh, the town of Endriago. Um, and if he doesn't act, then the, the, these beasts are going to destroy that settlement. Um, and they're going to come in and they're going to kill the beast, whether he likes it or not. Uh, and Lord Sartana just accepts this as a declaration of war. And the lion sort of says to him, well, do you really think you can uh, stand against us? And Lord Sartana says, probably not, but we wanted to be left alone and you just insist on invading us and storms out with his men. Um, and then Brother Amadis calls out and says, is this true that there's, there's a beast attacking uh, Andriago? Um, and the lion says, yeah, they found out recently, um, but this beast um, has just been slaughtering anybody that exits the city. Yeah. Uh, and we find out that's where uh, Brother Amadis was born. Uh, and then from here, he declares a great quest uh, against the beast of Indrago. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and, what we find and, out and that ends the chapter. Yeah. yeah. Cause uh, what we find out from this is obviously it, it so obviously that, you know, it, it's like they found out, I say they found out a short while ago. I think it's two days before. Um, so yeah. long enough that you could probably have, you know, said something before. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Short enough that you can kind of go, all right, fine. It's medieval. It's feudal. We'll, we'll let that slide. It's not like there's anything that uh, Amadis can do at that point. And we also learn a bit more about the idea of quests. So it's like if a, one of the knights declares a quest, it's like um, it's, a, it's like legally binding, um, yeah. it, but it's like it's like a, a similar to the oath, right? It's it it can only end in either the beast or the knight's death. It can't end any other way. And we also I don't know if we find out here, but we find out as we go along, obviously that for a supplicant to become a knight or like you know one of these guys that's training, they have to, or at least up until this point anyway they have to kill a beast themselves that they declare their own quests against beasts and and, and that's that's how it happens um yeah. and i think it's brother um ramiel says like you know the beast picks you um yeah. like your beast will pick you and i think uh, in this in this instance obviously brother amadis has already slayed many a beast he's he's done his beast to, to become a knight but endriago being his uh, town of birth he's like no i'm gonna go and sort this beast out and uh go and go and get on with it and um yeah you know it's not like you get a war party all running out to get the beast together he just trots off on his own no, um, just goes for it and you're like okay all right fair enough good luck uh and in, in the meantime obviously at this point the lion has declared war and there's i think it's an emir no it's not an emir. it's a horrible it's a horrible sort of you know, you hear his thought, or you hear him speaking his thoughts about it, and it's like he's questioning whether, you know, the lions kind of engineered this and almost goaded uh, Zartana, Zartana into it. Yeah. Um, like by, you know, showing him the strength of force, rubbing his nose in the fact that no one wants to join his, uh, you know, um, like order of the order of Lupus Knights or anything like that. The Lupus Knights, no one wants to join that anymore. They're all joining the order and aren't we all big and strong and there's kind of I don't like the whatever deal Lufa struck I don't think the lion's aware of it and so that works at cross purposes as well because one of them yeah. saying well 
you said you'd never come to us and like the lines like, I never said that, what are you on about? Like, yeah. and it kind of causes a problem in itself. And it's one of those, I think as, you know, anyone, as you go through it and you know more about the Dark Angels, there's a lot of secrets and lies and like, uh, you know, there's a lot of secrets they carry as a, as a legion as, and, and this starts with this knightly order and it's mm. kind of like, now I think it all starts from a maybe a place of good intention but never ends well. Well, it's the theme, isn't it? Like, he hasn't even met the Emperor um, but they just have this, just do what I say, trust yeah. that I'm doing the right thing uh, and then if they, if they just included a few more people in on their big ideas, maybe people wouldn't get so upset with them. Maybe, but, maybe. Um, I think it also um, sort of throws back as well um, to like the lion saying that he wishes he could just get rid of the traditions. Um, and like we say, the, the Knights of Lupus are one of the last people really holding on to their traditions. They're, they're Although everyone traditions. still wants to keep it, they're the only ones who haven't sided with him. So yeah, going them into war is best for business at this point. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think it's a whole question. Is it him that questions it? Uh, uh, maybe it's Nemo. One of them I questions think, uh, it and is like, should we be fighting against, you know, like other men? Yeah, definitely. You know? uh, uh, someone def it definitely does come up in a bit. Someone yeah. does think, uh, at least they uh, they at least ponder it in their mind. Yeah. Um, is it a just war? That's the term yeah. that's used. Is it a just war? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're into chapter seven and um, we find out it's been about five months since Brother Amada set off on his quest um, and feels like since he's gone, everyone sort of uh, is a bit down in the dumps. Uh, there's obviously a, pres a presence missing um, and without him there to sort of guide them, Zahari or Nemo will have gone back into their uh, games of uh, one-upmanship uh, and Zahari was starting to get a bit tired of it himself. Yeah. Um, the campaign of the beast is still being waged um, but now a majority of the order has been diverted into the war on the Knights of Lupus who've been pushed back to their fortress at Sangrula uh, or Blood Mountain as it's known and they are now um, stuck under siege. Um, as um, the boys are still not uh, knights they're not obviously at war so they're back at the fortress um and like you say this 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 is where it comes up where they're sort of questioning and it's Sahariel um that's sort of asking and wants to know who was telling the truth was it the lion or was it Sartana uh and Nemuel tells him it doesn't matter either way we're in the war and uh history is always written by the victors and we'll tell our own truth um and Nemuel tells him that's the way of the war uh, the dead will be forgotten, uh, and yeah, Zahara wonders if it's a just war that they're fighting. So there yeah. we go. There you go. Um, and then all of a sudden, the afternoon trumpets begin to sound uh, throughout the fortress, signalling the return of Brother Amadis. Um, everyone rushes to the Morium gates at the entrance of the fortress to get a view of the returning hero okay. who has slain the last one of the last great beasts. Um, Everyone gathers and they see the knight riding slowly on his horse and everyone begins to cheer. But Zaharil has a premonition that something is wrong. Um, and as the knight gets closer, everyone starts to see he's actually covered in blood. His left arm is hung limp by his side. Yeah. The bone shattered. His face is drained of colour. Um, and all of his effort is keeping him on the horse. His, his Destra or the, the horse, as they, for some reason they call them Destras, but yeah. uh, that's got chunks torn out of it as well, if I remember. Yeah. It's tail yeah. gone and it's like mane's all messed up. And He looks like he's in rough shape too. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he comes through, some knights help him out of the saddle um, and lay him on the ground and the crowd starts pushing in uh, and then Lord Cypher booms that they must move back and he takes a knee next to uh, Amadis, who's uh, laying on the floor. Uh, Zahariel manages to get through the crowd, and he gets beside him. Uh, and he can see that uh, the wounds are mortal, as he's literally laying on the floor, holding his stomach, uh, all his intestines in. Yeah. Uh, and he's still um, just bleeding horribly. Um, and Lord Cypher knows he's going to die, and asks if he has a, a velictition. A velictition? I think that's how it says. Uh, um, what, do they, what do they call it? 
Valedic diction. So that, oh, that yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Valed, 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 valediction. Yeah, my pronunciation isn't going to get better through this series. We're going to get to book seventy, and I'm just going to be like, <laughs> yeah, it is, it's, it's, it's valediction. I was, I think you've done well so far because this one's got some real names in it. So I was like, yeah. I'm going to be interested to see how you go, but you've done, you've done all right. Well, Zahariel's name is written a hundred times, so I had to get that <laughs> one right. I couldn't be, I couldn't be getting that wrong all the way through this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, um, but this, yeah, so he asks him if he's got any sort of, I guess, final words, and he says yeah. yes, um, and he says Zahariel's name, um, and Lord Cypher sort of pushes him in and tells him to listen, uh, and we hear the Dying Knight's words, uh, and we find out that those who hear the Dying Knight's words have a duty to the dead, um, and Amadis, in his last sort of action, hands his pistol to Zahariel and tells him to carry it with pride and use it well. And he tells him that it was a, the beast that did this was a, a Calibanite lion. Uh, and everyone at this point had thought that the Lionel Johnson had killed the only one. But now yep. we know that there is two. Um, and as Brother Amadis tries to tell him something else, he, he dies. Uh, and Zahariel and everyone is obviously swept with grief. Um, and Lord Cypher tells him to use the weapon with pride and do it justice to the knight who just died. And he says, I will have no doubt about it. And Lord Cypher knows what's coming and tries to stop him. So um, but before he can, yeah, before he can, before he can put a stop to it, Zahariel um, declares a quest against the beast of Endriago. Um, and so, obviously, like we said, it's a binding contract. He said it out loud. There's no going back. Um, yeah. he, he has to do it now. Um, and before he sets off, um, the other supplicants um, throw a feast in his honour prior for him setting off uh, and sort of they're all telling him that it's a suicide mission he shouldn't have done it um there'll be other time another another chance to uh, avenge him and he shouldn't be going by himself yeah um and he says he has to he took he saw him die he took his weapon it needs to be him um and the whole point of the quest is for it to be hard um and then they're like well the only other caliber night lion was killed by lionel johnson um and even he was severely wounded uh, and look at him compared to you. Yeah. Um, but anyway, they, they just um, forget about it for now because they are friends, really, uh, and they have enjoy the feast. Uh, and then uh, Zaharil sets off a couple of days later on his quest. That's um, it. Off he goes. Yeah. And Into the wild. They all think he's gonna. They all think he's gonna die. Um, uh, as you said, fell, fell, as I said, it comes to a bit of a head. He, he has to really strongly talk back to his uh his pals um yeah. and sort of say no look i am doing this and that's where he mentions again like the beast picks you um you know i've been waiting for this all my life this is how i'm gonna be a knight just you know let let me have it yeah. um and I, I, he doesn't really get it until sort of midway through that he kind of goes oh, okay they're actually saying goodbye to me so um you know it's it, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a yeah weird situation a bittersweet that's that's yeah. it so they're all there but they all know it could be the last time they're all together um and then obviously off he goes and i think when he gets because then this, this next bit we follow um zaharil for a bit while he's doing his yeah. quest and he goes to um Andriago and and there's there's no one there like he, he has to find a woodsman a brave enough woodsman to take him into the woods outside the town and yeah. kind of point him in the right direction, but he'll only take him so far mm -hmm. because he's he's like nervous himself, yeah. like and he knows the area where recently a load of the the townspeople were attacked because um, you know winter's coming um, and they need to get out. Like all of the people that live there need to go out. They need to gather food. They need to gather wood, but they can't because they're they're trapped in. The, the, the doors or the gates of the town have got these mad slashes all over them where this this beast has, has been encroaching right up to the town itself. Um, and like he's this 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 woodsman takes him in takes a hero into the woods to point him into the direction of like the the uh, the lightning struck tree where yeah. it is, it's like a, a big point and then he says something to him that kind of sticks with him. He doesn't use like uh, the usual Calibanite wording to like, you know, see you around or, you know, see you next time. 
well met, all of that sort of stuff. He sort of says, you know, may the watchers look after you and, and like, you know, ease your passing and, and or ease your pain and guide you the way. Yeah. It, it's, it's very much a, like a, a phrasing that is like, okay, you're dead. So, <laughs> like, hopefully, you know, the watchers are there. And, and, and this is the first time we hear about the watchers. Yeah. Um, who again, uh, Dark Angels lore fiends will know of and will hear of, and you can, I think you can still have them as miniatures in the in your in your Dark Angels army. Um, but yeah, the the Watchers, uh, which go on to form part of, of much more of the Dark Angels lore. This is the first time we meet or hear of them. Um, and Zahara, as he's trotting through the forest, is like a bit. Oh, I wonder what he's talking about. The Watchers, mm. I'm not quite sure. Um, and like that's that's when he bumps into him, right? That's that's where he kind of he comes across them because he, I think he wanders into an area of the forest that he notices is yeah. diseased. Um, and you know, those of you that have read other Black Library books either before this or, or after will know that um, you know these diseased trees and the descriptions of it, it's got a touch of Nurgle. Like, you know, we mm. don't know that it's Nurgle. We don't know it's any of that, but it sounds very Nurgly. And yeah. you, you kind of get the hints here. You know, you put one and two together that you kind of go, okay, maybe maybe this world is, uh, has got a taint of chaos about it. You know, maybe, yeah. maybe there is these great beasts, uh, uh, you know, potentially chaos related. You know, there's this forest, big, deep, thick forest that's that's got Nurgle's plague. You know, it's a bit of a garden. That, uh, that's yeah. None of this is implicitly said, but you know you've read if you've read any of the Black Library, you kind of know that's what they're hinting at. They're kind of underlying yeah. that wherever we as humanity exist, so does chaos. You know, so again, one of those ongoing themes. Um, and he's in this he's in this diseased area, and he can like he can he can feel this malign presence, or like you know he's he's got this sense, and then he starts sort of hearing things. Yeah. Like and hearing these, these these words, like you know, some there's one voice saying, "No, no, we should just kill him." The taints on him. Other ones saying, "No, no, no, just ignore him. He he can't see us and stuff like that." And then he calls out to them, and they're like, "Whoa, he can. This dude can hear and see us. Like this yeah. is this is not this is not kosher." And that's where we get the the, the learning of the the mystical magical element to do with the watchers, in that they're they're not necessarily beings of Caliban, but there's something about them, you know, yeah. whether they're chaos powered, whether they're demons, whether they're, you know, something altogether different, maybe just like, as I said, uh, warp sensitive, mm. you know, those subhumans. You don't, you don't know. It's, it's never described. Yeah. But what they do say is that um, there is a, they say that, that it, the quote is that there is a taint within Zaharil. Um, and obviously, yeah. we hear the term taint before. Um, and it's not necessarily a chaos taint, but it is this warp taint, let's say. Um, but he just says yeah. that there's a taint within them. Um, and it's, um, they basically, he says, what, what is this taint? What does it mean? You know, what, what, is this good or bad? Like, is it evil? Like, you know, he's got so many questions and they're like, oh, go back to the, the lightning stump, or the lightning tree. And, and your questions will be answered. So he kind of leaves a bit confused, really, about yeah. what's got on. Um, They're really not helpful, are they? They, no. they? they give him a few more riddles for him. Um, they, so, they sort of pop out of the darkness and say, we won't kill you, but you need to go and promise to uh, only fight for good and yeah. head, back to that, head back to that tree and you'll find what you're looking for. Yeah. And that's really, they're no help to him at all. No, as I said, it, I don't. I don't even really think it's there for him. I think it's like right, we've got to get the watchers in somewhere so that future, you know, later on down the line in the heresy and another law and stuff like that, we'll be able to go. Mm. Oh, that's where they're from, um, because you could take them out and all of the stuff with the hero that the hero could still happen. Yeah, you could take all of the watchers out of this, and it wouldn't change what happens he could still discover his powers and all this sort of stuff it's just to drop in that word taint and <laughs> <laughs> that's it and, and and to kind of then you know drop the that that kind of easter egg for future oh this is where the watchers come in for those that you know are aware of the their dark angels law but 
it does give the emphasis. So he walks into the woods. He sees, you know, that they're diseased. So there's there's your nod to chaos. He sees the yeah. watchers. They're a bit spooky. They send him back, like saying he's got this taint, which he doesn't know what it is. He heads back. He's, you know, daydreaming about it or doesn't really know, you know, isn't really thinking. And then suddenly the lion's on him out of nowhere. Yeah. And I say that this is where you get the first real description of uh, the Caliber Knight lion because they mm-hmm. say it's a lion, but the description is that, you know, it's only called a lion because it's kind of got a mane. Um, yeah. Otherwise, it's this massive beast, massive jaws, like chitin armor, like scaly. Like the mane itself is like spiky, like frills. So, yeah, it's it's not, you know, it it it's not mucking around. Like, no, you know, it's a great beast, but it's one of the, it's on, you know, it's on the nasty end of the scale. With the one that they came across in the woods, you know, uh, those years ago, which was like a fly, kind of gorgon type one, which by all accounts would be more of your run of the mill beast. This is right up there in in, in like end boss beast levels. So um, yeah. it's yeah, and it gets stuck right into it. So it doesn't really give him much time to prepare. Um, and like, I think it takes out his Destra first of the horse first of all. Yeah, in, in good old um, tradition tradition that we've had, he gets knocked off of his horse. Um, so he doesn't need to die straight away. Yeah, and and then yeah. the poor horse gets. Uh, torn to shreds much like that nine-year-old boy <laughs> from early on yeah yeah the poor old yeah poor old horse gets it quite quick and then uh, so while the horse is getting uh a while yeah the killing of the horse distracts the lion he starts unloading his pistol so he's got yeah. brother amadis's pistol um which is obviously you know bequeathed to him and i can't remember how many barrels it's got but it's, it's got it takes a magazine right so it's not yeah. We may be on a feudal world, but this is still a pretty good gun, and it's got rounds that explode uh, or are designed to explode in impact. So they're designed yeah. to pierce and then explode. And so he's he's got, I think he's got three clips in total. So he unloads one, like entire clip at this lion, and it's kind of it's punching the side of it, stuff like that. But it's really not doing too. You know, it's it's kind of maybe distracting him, but the lion's not that interested. It's not really no. doing enough to to cause any problems. And he's he's thinking to himself, right? How am I going to do this? He's like the smart smart part of me is like I should use my pistol to as a, you know a great amount as I can, like get all of the ranged attacking that I can to try and take it down, and then we'll get stuck in. And then the other half of him is like. I'm not going to kill it until I get stuck in because this range stuff isn't really doing anything. And so I think, if I remember correctly, he kind of like he empties one clip, slaps yeah. another into the pistol, and so he's got two in total left. And he's like, "I'm going to, I'm going to go in. I'm going to give it a go." Yeah. And so, you know, at this point, the lion is uh, the caliber knight lion is 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 now firmly back in play. Like he's he's, he's had his snack, and he's yeah. like, "Right, I'm coming after you." Um, and to be fair, like Hyrule to, to Hyrule doesn't do too bad to, to begin with, given where this, this beast is supposed to be. Um, but then he does get knocked about a bit, and like I think his, his uh, shoulder or like one of his arms gets battered a bit. I think he, get, he breaks a couple of ribs. Um, and I think the lion. I know that's they have a bit of back and forth, you know, parry and all this sort of mm. stuff. It's a, it's a, it is a good fight. It's definitely worth reading yeah. because it's good stuff. And then I think yeah. the lion's coming in with his jaws. And then again, to use my uh, video game analogy, when I said end boss, Zahariel inputs cheat code and his psycho power manifests. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's referred to later as scrying. Um, but effectively, he kind of. It's a bit like that scene in the Matrix where Neo sees it all in ones and zeros and can reach in. Yeah, um, and it's the same thing here. He kind of almost gets like an X-ray vision, and he can see into the lion, and he can see like uh, its it heart and stuff like that. And time almost seems to slow down, and he kind of moves his hand like he into the beast with his pistol, yeah. so his pistol hand against the lion's heart. 
and then like in that moment suddenly time snaps back to normal he pulls the trigger and the lion clamps down on his shoulder i believe with his teeth yeah. and then suddenly it goes boom and like its heart's obviously exploded as the round's gone into it and yeah. Zahiru's like arm is like in the chest of the lion and obviously he's been bitten and he just lays there like <laughs> like, well, that's that then. Um, so it is. It, as I said, I've not done it any justice, but that it is a yeah. really good fight. Like it is well worth a read. And as I said, it's, it's one of the frustrating bits about this book because there are bits of it that are punctuated with these really good moments. Yeah. Um, but as I said, it, it's kind of preceded and then followed by bits that you just you don't, you don't really need. Yeah. Um, but he, he patches himself up as best he can, like, uh, like you know, pulls the lion off of him. All he's got. So one of the things that they have to do as part of their quest is take back, you know, a trophy or something to indicate that they've done it. And all he can really take is the head because mm. he's, he's effectively totally nuked it with his uh, heart pistol shot. So he grabs the head. He like patches himself up, like he puts like loads of bandages in the big puncture wounds he's got, and he heads back into uh, Embryo- Endriago, where yeah. I think he rests up. I, think, I can't remember how many days it says there's like five. He days. stays there for a week. A week, yeah. So he, he yeah. rests up so that he's then strong enough. I think they give him a horse as well. Um, yeah. Another another horse to the grinder. Um, <laughs> a, so he can head back to Alderuk, which is. Um, Obviously, the, the the monastery of uh, mm. of the order, um, and this is this is a similar time scale. Late, like, I can't. Remember. It takes him thirty nine days to get home. That's it. So he's yeah. he's he's taken the journey home, and he's kind of, you know, he's taken his time, almost leisurely. Why not? Mm. And he, yeah. he gets he gets back, and the sentries see him, and like the same sort of trumpets as when Amadis came back go up, and like. Um, from Nemiel and uh, the other two, can't remember their names now, but from those guys, there's, there's almost disbelief that he's coming yeah. back. Everyone thought he gets... was long dead by now, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, they, they, they said, like, oh, we, we, we didn't know what to do with his stuff. Like, you know, like, I mean, luckily they didn't divvy it up or burn it, but yeah. they thought about it. Um, and he gets back. I bet and... when he went, uh, Nemiel was like, I can't believe my luck. I'm yeah. going to win all these challenges now. He's not here. That's it. That's it. And I can't remember which who said it. I don't know if it's Ramiel or someone else. But when he gets in, they're like, right, get your stuff. You've got to go into this. Well, it's really weird because it's it's just a gatekeeper who tells him that. It's not. Yeah. He, he literally, he, he gets in, he gets a bit of a wave, and then the gatekeeper goes, the, go uh, the orders examiners are going to come and meet you. Get out of your quarters. You're going to go sit in some temporary accommodation, um, and then you'll you'll get moved once we know what to do with you. Yeah, um, and uh, so yeah, it's it's a bit of a weird one because he has he has a chat. That's where he has the chat with Nemiel, and Nemiel's like, rather than like being like, oh my god, well done, like I can't believe you did it, like a calibonite lion. He's like, you're so lucky. And it's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, all right, Nemiel, back off. Like I've yeah. been gone a couple of months. Like, look at the state. Yeah. And and like he's like you're lucky. He's like calling me lucky. I've got to sleep in this like shed. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's really weird. But the, and then we also find out as well that while Zahari has been gone fighting this Calibonite lion, just no, we don't get any more information. But all we find out is that while he was gone, Nemiel raised a quest and went off, killed his own one, and he got did. back about three days before Zaharil. That's it. The, um, uh, the 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 savage donkey of Riverton or something. Like that. Like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. But what what beast did you kill? It's uh, yeah. yeah. They've all like I think all four of them have done. Well, maybe maybe that. No, 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 the the other two don't do ne- ne- anything. Ne- yet. Nemiel's definitely done one though. He's yeah. he's been out. And he's he's done his beast quest as well. And you're yeah. like, really? It explains okay. why he's got such a chip on his shoulder because Zaharil got like two whole chapters about killing the greatest beast ever. Zaharil gets two lions to say, yeah, but while this was all going on, he yeah. went out and did something similar. And he did it early. He did it quicker. Like, he, he, did it quicker. he did it quicker. He got back a couple of days earlier, and he's all cleaned up, ready to go. Yeah. But I suppose um, it's because it's, uh, I suppose because it's a Calibonite lion, 
it's like big yeah it doesn't it doesn't matter what you killed like you know the the vicious you know chicken of bristol or uh, or whatever <laughs> whatever <laughs> took down um, oh, what's oh, what, what's the uh, one from Monty Python called? What's that rabbit called? Oh, uh, the, uh, the 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 oh, what's it called? The Beast of uh, Carrick Dune. Um, yeah, the Beast of Carrick Dune. <laughs> it's only a rabbit. <laughs> rabbit stew. Jesus Christ. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, like you say, so he he moves out of his quarters, and Attius is sort of helping him, and said that like, he's he's really happy for him, but now he's worried that. Now the beasts are all nearly extinct. He's never going to get a chance to prove himself to become a knight. Yeah. And so Haril says um, that there will always be a need um, for knights. As long as there is this fortress, uh, and as long as this fortress remains their rock, then their traditions will always last. Um, yeah, because that's, that's where they talk about um, Alder Rook and the naming of it, isn't it? That's, that's where it yeah. talks about that, why you know Alder Rook means the rock again yeah. for those uh for dark angels law um that that name will be uh very familiar and important but i won't i won't hesitate on that too much because that's, we, we, the yeah. Job. that's yeah that really is uh <laughs> I, 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 i've heard of the rock but yeah um we'll get to it i guess yeah um so from there um the order have a celebration and a feast in zahari's honor um all the other knights greet him and welcome him as a brother uh, and then as to celebrate, they basically pick him up, chuck him around and give him the bumps. Um, yeah. And it's really weirdly written this because he's just come back from fighting this beast. These grown men throwing him in the air in celebration actually scares, scares him to death. Like, he can't understand what's going on. Um, and it's, it's not bit, until afterwards. It's a bit strange as well because Luther like, explains it like it's the... Uh... You know, like whereas they've had the ceremonies before, and they're like, you know, this is the, you know, the spiral, and this is the that. It's yeah. like, it's like it's the the, you know, the invisible trampoline. I can't remember what they call well, it. They, they, yeah, they really, they really like labour the point. I can't yeah. remember what they called it. But it's basically the bumps. And but it's it, it's like that episode of The Simpsons where he joins the stone cutters, <laughs> yeah. and it's like uh, this is the, uh, you know, the the unblinking eye, and they're just smacking his ass. They're just paddles. paddling. Him, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, and this one's the paddling of the swollen ass, and it's just the same thing over and over. Yeah. It's like that, and it's yeah. like, all right, uh, you know, I, I don't, I get, I get why they were trying to do it. It was kind of like showing because Luther talks about it as well. He's like, you know, oh, we do have a sense of humor, we can yeah. have fun, um, so we're going to give you the bumps, and then we're going to get pissed on wine. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. As I said, again, you then put yourself into it and go. All right, I don't know how Zahari was right now. Maybe he's 13, 14. <laughs> like, there's a load of men yeah. chucking him around. <laughs> but surely, like, I mean, I, I know he came for, he turned up when he was seven, but surely, like, even in these peasant villages when they celebrate, like, it's, it's not anything, it's not a scientific thing, is it? Everyone, you throw someone in the air to celebrate. It's not, it can't be the first time he's ever seen that happen. But oh. honestly, the way it's written is like, He's gonna have a heart attack. I know. It, they it, can't. It they can't believe all these serious nights that yeah, are having a laugh. But like Luther says to him, like this is how you relax. Um, yeah, we're we're all brothers. Got, and, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit um, weird. And then they sort of say, um, "This is how we're we're all, we're all bonded. We're, we we fight and die together. We'd all die for each other. But when we can, we'll have a party and a, have a laugh." Um, but he does sort of go a bit serious and say. It is different for the lion because he's more complex um, and intelligent. Although he has got a sense of humour, when he tells a joke, no one else seems to get it. Yeah, it's uh, too high. He's, he's on another level, and um, Zahari sort of detects a bit of sadness from Lufa there because um, he obviously he, he can't connect with the lion the way he wants to. Yeah, um, there's, there's a detachment there, isn't there? He's just not. Yeah. He's he's beyond even the best of them. Yeah, and he he sort of feels sorrow for him because it's like Luther's probably like the greatest human uh, of the generation, but he's had the bad fortune to be born in the era of the lion. Um, and now, no matter what he does, he'll always be in the lion's shadow. And he sort yeah. of reflects between the lion and Luther and himself and Nemuel. Um, but he does feel like Luther generally loves the lion uh, and doesn't really feel any jealousy there. Um, because it, he, Luther's accepted what 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 his lot in life is, and he's doing a good job of it. 
Um, and he saw Luther tells him that he's definitely the greatest man that ever lived. Like, um, he, he's sort of got a perfect mind and also tells him that he's a, a perfect mimic and can recreate sounds of any animal in Caliban. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's going to play out anywhere else. I, I mean, but, um, have you read? Have you read? You haven't. You haven't got up to Fallen Angels yet, have you? No, not yet. No. Yeah, I don't believe there's any mimic scenes in that. Um, so I don't know. Like as I said, I found that interesting that you talked about it as well. I don't know whether it's just, you know, highlight again that, you know, he lived in the bushes for half of his life and or something like that, or whether he's just, yeah. you know, I don't know. It, it was it, again, it was a bit of a strange thing. Mm. But maybe it's supposed to humanise him a little bit or or ground him, like you know, oh, we actually. He does have a sense of humour, and he, he can do all of these amazing things. But all you see is the warrior, rather than um, yeah. Maybe maybe they're, they're, he's got some nice skills, other yeah. than just like cutting people in half. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so then he sort of says like he must be the loneliest man on the planet, and then he snaps out of like his his sort of um, melancholy um, and says that let's just enjoy the night, um, and you'll be initiated soon. Um, and he sort of tells him like back when he was first brought in and he had to sit and he was the boy saying, oh, let's just kill him. He's no good. But says that's just the role they had to play. It was the role of the devil. And he, didn't oh, he apologizes, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. And Again, he always kn- knew that he would do well. Um, it's, it's just another, had to play his part. Another one of those moments where they, they talk about tradition and, and yeah. like, you know, it's, it's something we do. One of us always has to play the devil. Um, and again, it's more of that foreshadowing and kind of context setting for everything that's going on. It's like you have to play your part and, mm. um, you know, for right or wrong or whatever that part happens to be, you've got to play it. And that yeah. plays out as a theme as, uh, in the heresy as a whole, right? But also in this, 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 in these books. Yeah. Um, and then he's going around the party, bumps into Nemiel and, and has that conversation we've already had, uh, bumps into Master Remiel and he says, well done, good job, uh, but now you're a knight, the, the real work begins, um, it's not just talk, and then Zahara ends up talking to uh, Lord Cypher, mm-hmm. um, and Lord Cypher at this point is well and truly pissed, um, and sort of starts talking more than he should, um, and says that he expects that um, very soon Master Remiel will become the next Lord Cypher once the Lion ascends to the role of Grandmaster, yep. um, which had been rumoured, um, and obviously he's, even Zahara had heard that rumour, but now he's been told by Cypher that that's going to happen. And uh, Lord Cypher, very, in a very haggard sort of uh, moment, says, I shouldn't have said that. I should yeah. not have said that. Um and then Cypher tells them that he's retiring in a few days. The lion's going to be elevated to Grandmaster. Luther will become his second in command, and he expects that Romeo will take his place. Yeah. Uh, and then realizing what he's done, he says, Keep that a secret. Um, I feel like you have a good future in the order. Uh, and he sort of gets up and, and walks off. Uh, and we find out that after this party, in a few days, um, a beast hunt is declared. Uh, and Lord Cypher uh, volunteers for the quest, rides out, and he's never seen again. Um, and then a few years down the line, once they sort of know that he's dead, um, a place of honour will be carved uh, into the rock yep. uh, and a little space put aside for if they find any bones of his or anything. Yeah, um, ashes or bones or whatever. Yeah. But otherwise, just his name. Yeah. Uh, but back at the party... Um, he um, is getting ready to become elevated to the rank of knight uh, by the lion. And before they do, he has a little conversation with the lion. And the lion says, uh, I've just found out that I'm going to be elevated to grandmaster. And Zahara tries to act surprised, but the lion says, don't worry, I heard, I heard Lord Cypher tell you. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, I know you kept it secret for all of 10 seconds. Um, it won't change anything. It's just a, it's just a title. Uh, everything will stay the same because he's pretty much been in charge anyway. It's yeah. just, uh, it's just tradition. Uh, and he sort of tells Zahari that they now share a brotherhood that no one else um, on the planet does because they are the only two men um, that um, have killed a Calibanite lion. And he would love to one day hear the story, which um, obviously scares Zahari. Um, and then the lion sort of uh, ponders, he sort of has a thought and says, it's a shame that they're making these beasts extinct. 
um, but Zahara tells him no, they're they're evil, they're killing machines, and they and they deserve it. Uh, and they sort of discuss like, how can you be so sure? And and Zahara says, well, both times he's fought them, he's just felt evil in them, uh, and it, as if there's uh, an unnatural presence uh, there. Uh, and the lion agrees with him and says, maybe they've been driven mad by the fact that they're, they're unique. Uh, and death is the best fate for them. Um, yeah, so they they haven't done the uh, the honourable thing of dying out. They're like the last of their kind, and uh, yeah. you know they they should have been evolved out. There's, as I said, there's there's definitely a few interesting bits that uh, that happen in this this yeah. section. Like uh, we see Nemiel, he gets uh, he gets a bit pissed up, um, so that's quite funny. Um, but I think um, it's like they lay it on thick this bond or, or perceived bond or, you know, brotherhood that um, the lion and Zahari will now share. Um, yeah. And, you know, he, I mean, throughout the entire book so far, they're laying on thick with Zahari, whereas maybe they're not, they're not paying much attention to the other characters like Nemiel, um, which is quite interesting just to keep in mind um, for, for as we get through this book, but also uh, when you get to the next uh, the next book in this particular like mini series, let's call it. Yeah. Um, so that brings us into chapter eleven, uh, and we jump forward. Um, I'm not. Sure, it doesn't really say how how far in the future this is, but basically we're back uh, in the war. Uh, everyone who's been elevated is now um, taking part in the siege of um, Blood Mountain, um, and Zahara stood on the edge of the forest watching these giant siege engines. Uh, throwing flaming projectiles at the enemy castle and seeing the missiles coming back. Um, he's then pointed in the direction of uh, Sir, Sir uh, Hadaril, um, who is going to be obviously leading his squad, uh, tells him they're preparing to assault the main castle and he needs to go and catch up. So he uh, runs through the trenches, links up with Sir Hadriel and Nemil, um, and they're all he's surprised because he's turned up with his white cape and his armor and he gets there and they're all covered in mud, um, um, which he's shocked about because up until now, everything's about very uh, traditional, very pristine and clean. And they say, no, the lions told us get dirty because they're going to see you coming and you don't want to get taken out by a sniper. Uh, so a little bit of tradition being pushed aside for tactics here, um, which he does. So, um, they're then told that they're part of the main assault. Um, there's going to be two diversionary assaults on either side of the castle, uh, and one of them is going to be led by the lion. And everyone's quite surprised and having a bit of a talk about why the lion wouldn't be leading the main assault. Um, and they sort of come to reason that actually he's going to lead the diversion because the defenders are going to think that the lion is the main target. And hopefully that will um, put all their focus onto them, making their assault easier. Yeah, and we, we um, learn that... That, that part, as you said, a lot of people are surprised about it, but we also learn that um, like Luther and the Lion had a bit of a bit of a disagreement about that, about that yeah. particular tactic. And obviously, it's all hearsay because like Nemiel's like, oh no, I heard it from so-and-so who heard it from so-and-so who was next to the command tent when when the argument yeah. was happening. And you don't know, did it, did an argument happen? Did they actually have a fight or was it all part of this grander scheme you know how tactically astute is the lion is it is it more you know secrets and and clever manipulation or is it just they they had a bit of a ding dong because he didn't yeah. want the lion to die you know on a distractionary fight you know he's too important to the order but regardless of that it's kind of again it's a bit of an aside it's just there to highlight maybe you know as, as friendly as the lion and luther are maybe there is a little bit of you know, tension, I yeah. say tension, um, but they go ahead anyway. Yeah, well, it also sort of just shows that how everyone loves to gossip as well. Like, you don't know if this is true for some whatever reason, Nemo has decided to bring it up as well, just because they all like to have an opinion to uh counter each other. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, so as, as they're weighing, like, the wall that they're about to go through is breached uh, and goes up in a big explosion. Uh, and Zahariel still has his pistol from uh, Brother Amidus, but he has his new sword, which has been fashioned from the tooth of the lion that he killed, uh, which Nemil is openly jealous of. 
the order goes out and they charge through the breach um, and they charge and the firepower from the enemy is brutal. Um, all of his training up until this point had been for one-on-one -on -one battles, sword fights, um, and this has been completely different because now they're running into a hail of bullets and projectiles and people are getting dropped left, right and centre. Um, and it hasn't been the uh, quick um, breach that they expected. Uh, and he always sort of believed that he would know his killer and would die at a skilled hand. But now he's worried that he's going to get hit by a stray bullet uh, and all of his honour will be for nothing. Yep, that's um, it. And yeah, and like we sort of said, touched on earlier, here he sort of now, now that it's a bit too late, he's sort of openly remembering that this armor used to be capable of protecting someone uh, from all sorts of damage, but now it's so aged and held together by uh, tape. Yeah. Um, he's starting to uh, regret regret his uh, armor at this point. Yeah, because it, it, I, I can't remember this the point they talk about how it used to be out of seal closed, but like, you know, I think there's one at least a couple of the nights uh get set on fire um yeah and like obviously it, it just burns through like all of the seals and joints and stuff like that and it's not you know it's not the uh power armor mark one no. or whatever it, it once was um and so although it offers you know good protection it's it's not what it yeah it's, it's not what it was originally designed for but they as i said they they get really bogged down, don't they? Like, um, yeah, they really struggle to get through. Um, and I think Zaharu even says at one point, like he, he kind of says, like stop or, or you know, intimates to like rally round. And actually, Luther kind of bursts through at this point and is like, no, keep moving, and like yeah, forces uh, them to, to <clears throat> keep going. Yeah, it's like this this barrel of explosives gets thrown over a wall at them and he shouts get, get down and like you say Luther says no gets his pistol and blows it up mid-air and tells them all to get up and get going um, yeah keep moving and obviously keep going. inspired by Luther, they get up and follow him in and at this point a load of knights come flying out at them and um they have a bit a bit of a proper battle here and um Zahara manages to duck an axe blow and uh kills his attacker and then he takes the moment to sort of look around at the carnage going on around him. Um, and then because he's not paying attention, he gets smashed in the chest by someone's sword, uh, which rips his armor up and, and sort of sends him flying, rips his faceplate off. Yeah, it's how um, it comes off, doesn't it? And he's just able to avoid a killing blow uh, and snap back into action and, and, and chops off this guy's legs and then shoots him in the I put face. The shins. Yeah, I remember <laughs> yeah. that. <bit. laughs> <laughs> cleaves his legs and then uh, as he's laying there rather than just let him bleed out shoots him in the shoots face <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> and uh cracks on <laughs> sidebar on this i was going to say because this is another one of those those battles and bits that is worth reading the rest of it to get to yeah. because it is a really good section like it is it is really you know we laugh about this dude getting cut in the shins and then shot in the head but like it is you know, we're, we're just laughing about it you know that, that's what we're laughing about on the pod, but at, on, on the discussion. But it is a really good section of the book. Like it, it's yeah, like yeah. really fast paced. It's uh, it's interesting to see it, and it's kind of got like four or five different stages to the battle because we've had outside where they're preparing to mm -hmm. storm it, they're storming it, and they're struggling. Then they're inside and they're fighting these knights, and then we've got yeah. at least two other bits to go. Yeah, um, yeah. So. From there, um, they have to sort of regroup, um, and we go into the sort of like like quite a good bit now as well. Mm -hmm. um, they regroup under Sir Hardrill, uh, and the surviving knights um, sort of gather, um, and they manage to capture the cannons from the outer walls and turn them facing inwards, um, and manage to breach the inner wall. Uh, and as they go through. Um, there's all these giant cages lining the walls uh, and out in the courtyard. Uh, and there's a hundred of the Knights of Lupus lined up uh, and above them is uh, Lord Sartana. And uh, as they initially, the order charged, they all sort of, their charge is just killed. Like they, they all falter immediately because in these cages are a number of uh, great beasts um, that oh, clearly the Knights of Lupus have been kept captive. Yeah. Um, uh, the Knights of Lupus back off, and Lord Sar Lord Sartana basically tells them that they're all here to die, and opens the cages, 
and outpour um, the last, I guess, the last remaining beasts. Pretty much, um, yeah. yeah. Like they've, they've got this menagerie, this almost zoo of uh, great beasts left. Yeah. Uh, you know, we don't know it yet, but you can have a pretty fair guess that, you know, you go, OK, so the Knights of Lupus have been capturing them and keeping them. Um, yeah. For what end, we don't know yet. Like, no. but um, letting them all out in one go certainly causes... Because if you think if up to this point, you think about all the great beasts we talked about, you know, you had that Gorgon type one at the beginning, yeah. took out, you know, half a class. <laughs> You've got the, the, the lion, like the Calibanite lion, yeah. um, takes out Brother Amadis, like who is an old school knight who's taken down loads of beasts. Um, and then suddenly you've got loads of them all being launched at you in one go. Yeah, it's it, it's going to be messy, right? And while that's happening, yeah. if I remember correctly, they're doing that. And the Knights of Lupus kind of retreat right into the center of the keep. They're like, yeah. right, we're just going to let the beasts do do work while we, you know, hunker down and see what happens next. Yeah. Um, and there's there's because I think there's. There's, well, there's definitely more than two beasts, but I, if I remember, there's loads. I think I think there's loads because there's, um, there's two beasts that they kind of focus the fight on. There's the one, yeah, like it's like a the bear. This first one. one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Which... And then, like in the background, you've got all the knights getting into groups and getting killed by various beasts and that. But yeah, like this first one is Zahariel, Nemiel, uh, and Sahadriel. Um, they get into the fight with the big bear-like creature. That's it, yeah. Um, and they're trying to figure out how to kill it because nothing they can do is causing it an injury. And then he manages this bit, the bear uh, smashes its fists into um, Hard Ariel, sends him flying, wrecks his armour, like he's out of the game uh, in a ruin. Yeah. Um, and Zahara was able to then wound it with his sword. And then it takes like a number of nights to actually bring this bear down. Um, and they basically like, hack it to death uh, yeah. and as Nemiro and Zahari will recover their weapons they sort of take the minute to look around uh, and they realise why Lord Sartana didn't want them to come anywhere near them um, into the North Wars because obviously what he's been doing would have been discovered and as they're looking around they can just see like a number of beasts that are still alive um, and the night the order is just taking losses they're taking the beasts down slowly but for every beast they're taking down, they're losing a handful of men. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's this one particular beast which is huge, bigger than the rest. Um, it's like uh, lizard-like um, mm -hmm. in appearance, and it's it's basically just stamping from cluster to cluster, just wiping them out as they go. Um, so Zahari and Nemiel and their squad dive back into the fight and charge at the uh, the last beast. Um, and uh, yeah, they and it, and this thing's just absolutely tearing apart. Um, and as they're charging it, um, Luther Luther runs headlong at it, does like a baseball slide underneath it, cutting him open. Um, and at that point, the the lion enters, leaps into the air, throws a spear um, straight into the beast through the beast's mouth. And as he's doing that. Lufa stabs upwards through this beast's neck and, and, and they manage to kill it together. Yeah. The beast basically explodes, falls over on top of Lufa, um, covering him in, him in gore, and the lion stands up proud and everyone cheers for the lion as Lufa pulls himself out. That's it. Um, He's under, underneath from the belly. The blood, the blood and guts <laughs> for this spear and like the yeah. lion's just pulling his sword out the, the head of the thing and it's like, uh, I think Zahariel mentions like he sees the flash like a flash of jealousy on Luther's yeah. face, um, which uh, yeah. is important because, as I said, it's it, it, again uh, like Black Library, uh, and if, not, if nothing else, they're unsubtle about these things. They do like to layer up these little moments um, where they're saying, like, you know, oh, Luther and the Lion, they're best buddies, but we're going to keep telling you that maybe Luther's, you know, a bit jealous. Is you know maybe there's something there that he's not too happy about. Yeah. And this is one of those key moments where they go, everyone's cheering for the lion, even though Luther's done, if anything, probably just as much work and, and has probably been a bit braver in his approach. And it's only him doing what he did that's allowed the lion to stab his sword in the, in, in the head of the, the beast. So yeah. 
you do it is written in a way that purposely overlooks Luther and makes you notice that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's, it's like uh, everything that Luther's done has always been in the shadow. So like here, he's gone under the beast and done the important work while the lion's been on display doing, like you said, not maybe not the, the key point that brought the beast down. Mm-hmm. Um, and then again, like until now, everything that we've seen where Zahari was noticed, these, it's all been like glimpses of sadness where the Luther's felt sorry for the lion. But here, yeah, the first time that it's sort of, openly said that he sees some jealousy creep up yeah. but you would be it doesn't matter how much you you're friends with someone you'd be pissed off if you did the hard work and they got the credit i mean like so. as i said it, it was de- it's definitely <laughs> both of them both of them do it like you know involved yeah. there i think the bit that i think luther is probably annoyed about is that everyone's cheering the lion yeah. no you know no, no, no one even comes over and drags him up he has to kind of like push the, himself out. push this <laughs> dragon beast off of him and like you know wipe all the guts and crap off of him and like you know i don't know i'm assuming someone at some point goes over and gives him a pat on the back but oh, yeah like you know where's where's his cheer like you know where's exactly. the uh, you know Luther and the lion yeah like it's yeah. Uh, we can both be winners <laughs> you know uh, yes you would you would be a bit annoyed um yeah. you know that's that's human nature um, so yeah, but they get on with the, the last bit of the battle now. So um, all the survivors are now in the courtyard, and the lion declares that the knights of Lupus are to be destroyed, to be slaughtered, and no survivors yeah. uh, or prisoners to be taken. Uh, and he smashes down the, the door to the keep with his sword, and the knights pour in and spread out. So um, Zaharu and Nemuel end up alone down some abandoned halls. Uh, and as they're sort of creeping along, they hear some quiet movement nearby and they burst through um, some big wo- wooden doors into a chamber, which appears to be a la- library. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the far end, they find uh, Lord Sartana. And he's quite annoyed that um, the lion has sent two 15 year old boys to come and kill him. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and not anybody of actual, of any actual honor. Yeah. Uh, and he sort of tells them that the beast has led them to ruin uh, and with the slaying of the beasts, they will all be doomed. Uh, he doesn't really explain um, too he, much, but he he does mention he, so he does mention a couple of bits about like tradition again here as well because he yeah. talks about how you know he says I think he says to I can't remember which one of them he says to him, but he says like you know you talk about tradition you talk about honor you know your order was the first to break in tradition by yeah. uh, recruiting uh, lowborn. Um, I think he's what did he say he, he, like. Again, uh, he says something like uh, something to the idea that you know it's a bit socialist, um, effectively, like you know yeah. you're going, you're, you're recruiting everyone, and then he puts the idea or seeds the idea in their head, like what what have the knightly orders been for? Yeah, they've been they've been to protect against the beasts. But what yeah. do you do when there are no beasts left? Like and, exactly. and, and this, you know this it, again, it's laying that seed, and there's a couple of so it's quite interesting because the entire and will come in like the Imperium part comes into this because this quest that uh, Johnson is undertaking is his like microcosm version of a great crusade, but he can yeah. only do it in a planet. So it's like, right, my great crusade is going to be unite the villages of man um, and defeat the Xenos or the beast. And that's 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 what you can do. And almost like Sartana is an echo of Horace to a degree, because he's like saying, what do you do when there are no beasts left? And it's the same argument or same feeling that the Astartes are having however many years in the future when Horace is there saying, like, you know, what's going to happen to us when we've conquered the Imperium? Yeah. Like what's you know what what do Marines do? What do Astartes do when there are no wars? And will we just be gotten rid of? And that echoes like the the the, the sentiment that Sartana's talking about here. He's like, you know, you don't realise you've done it. Uh, and it, he also says like, you know, the the path to destruction or whatever it's the path to something destruction will do is always laid with best intentions. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously, you know. The lion has had good intentions in doing this quest, but he's not 
thought about the past, the future enough, and what happens beyond that. And may, maybe, as I said, maybe Sartana's wrong. You know, it could it could be all okay. But again, you can't help but feel like if they'd all got together and had a bit of a chinwag, maybe all of this <laughs> wouldn't have been needed. But, you know, yeah. that's it, it's more the sentiment is, is how they're trying to echo the wider schemes of the heresy and the wider narratives of the heresy across a micro version on Caliban and Warring Knight. Um, and that actually doesn't matter whether you're carrying like a plasma rifle or uh, a clapped out pistol that you're not quite sure how it works. The themes of, of the heresy and, and, and kind of expansion and tradition ring true no matter what type of world or mm. universe you're doing it across. It's like uh, history is doomed to repeat itself, no matter what, because they yeah. they all think they're doing it for the great, for the best intentions. But like you say, you can't you can't see yeah. how it's going to turn out um, because obviously chaos uh, is going to twist somebody somewhere along the line. And that that also talks very nicely to the spiral, which we we covered at the beginning. It repeats yeah. itself; it goes around and round. Yeah, uh, and then just to close out part two. Um, Zahariel sort of pulls his pistol to shut him up, um, but before he can do anything, Lord Sartana turns his own blade on himself uh, and pushes it into his chest. And like his last um, dying words are telling him that he knows that the lion is going to destroy Caliban. Um, and then he, he proceeds to die. And yep. those words trouble Zahariel for many years. Um, and that brings us to the end of part two. Indeed. Um, yeah, so if we'll wrap it up for this episode there. Um, like we said, it's a massive um, difference in the first five books. Um, obviously, we've gone back in time and like, there hasn't been any uh, real, uh, like we like to say, uh, bolt of porn. Um, and there's not really been, to, uh, we haven't even seen like a Space Marine yet. Oh. Um, so, but... The story, like we said already, we've already said it, the story is pretty decent. It's, it's some good background into sort of some motivations probably coming up, especially yeah. in the next part. Um, yeah, but it's not been too bad, really. No, as I said, I, I, you see that when, when you talk, when and you've probably seen it as we've gone through it, when we've been talking about the bits that we really like, it's easy to get animated because they are really cool and they're written really well. And if anything, I think... It, you know, the author reminds me of those bits in 15 hours. He, he writes battles and action really well. Yeah. Um, it's just you've got to, you've really got to push yourself through some of the bits in between to get to those bits. But once you yeah. do, they do pay off. Yeah. Um, so it is, it is, it is, as I said, we'll come more into it part two because it continues to pay off. It's worth a read. Um, it's worth. You know, for the for the, the completists and for the law masters, it's worth it. Um, mm. As I said, if you've made it this far through, obviously watch the next part with us. Mm -hmm. We'll go through the rest of it, and then you might decide you want to read it yourself anyway. But yeah. skip the bits that you know, or just read the bits we've told you to read. <laughs> yeah, but I would I would never say not to read it. Um, no, it's always good. It's, it's part of it. If you want to read the heresy, then it's part of it. Um, and it is all right. It's just me being nitpicky for a couple, for no reason, really. I mean, so, look at it. We've we've both read it twice now, so uh, you know it can't be that bad. Like it's it's, it's readable, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but no. So look forward to uh, part two, um, which will obviously be out probably within a week or two weeks of this one airing. Um, but for the time being, we'll say goodbye. Um, please do like, share, subscribe to this channel and like all our videos um and then obviously we're on instagram i'm ceramite facebook and twitter um, and everywhere else you can find us uh so see you later bye guys